Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, November 25th meeting of Lambton County Council. I'm going to call this meeting to order at 9.30 and would ask that you rise for a moment of silent reflection with me. Council, before we uh, get going with the formalities of our meeting this morning, and certainly on your behalf, I wish to recognize the extraordinary efforts of our staff over the last few days in response to the um, fire at the Kenwick building in the city of Sarnia. Also to recognize the first responders and the um, tremendous efforts of community partners that supported the uh, people who were displaced from housing, who remain displaced with uh, news hopefully in the near future as to uh, plans to get back home. Um, it was noted to me yesterday by um, our general manager of Lambton Public Health and our general manager of social services that uh, this effort wouldn't have gone um, as well as it had without the leadership from people from Sarnia and also the support from people like Miles Vanny from the Inn of the Good Shepherd, um, Victim Services, Lambton College, and uh, certainly the um, hoteliers who have accommodated our Ontario Works recipients have been phenomenal. So I know you want to join me in recognizing that community effort and it's, it's still unfolding. Thank you. Is there any member here this morning with a pecuniary interest to disclose? Seeing none? Okay. Rise and report motions of the in-camera session. Mr. Cribbs. There are two items, Warden. Uh, firstly, and uh, in fairness to uh, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor McKenzie did declare a pecuniary interest uh, properly while in camera on one of the issues, and I can confirm that he did, in fact, leave the in-camera session during its discussion. Uh, secondly, uh, there is one item to rise and report, which is that uh, Council did direct that a report pertaining to the county's policy of being a 50th percentile paying employer for its non-union staff be referred to the public portion uh, of the January PM committee uh, for consideration at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krebs. Um, Council, this morning with respect to items 7 and 8, I'm looking for a motion to allow all um, award recipients and presenters within the bar this morning. Moved by Councillor Weber, seconded by Councillor Bushy. All in favour? Opposed? That's carried. So first of all then, I would like to call forward um, Mike and Freedom Alone, Kelly Wilkes, Janet Oliver, and recognizing that uh, Norma Westlinder is unable to join us for uh, presentations recognizing the winners of my best day at the beach writing competition. Thank you.
Okay, Council, we have a, uh, four delegations this morning, and I'm going to first call upon Mr. George Malay, the General Manager of the Sarnia Lampton Economic Partnership, to provide an update to County Council regarding SLEPS activities and plans. Sorry, uh, I lost my glasses in the lake there a week ago, and these are old glasses, and uh, <laughs> I'm having trouble uh, adjusting here. So in terms of investment uh, process ac pro prospect activity, uh, it's, it's been a, a very good year, and we're actually seeing an uptick uh, in activity since June. Uh, presently, we're working with nine uh, bio-petrol shale companies, most of those companies are uh, industrial bioproducts companies. We've had three companies that have uh, visited the area uh, since the summer. Uh, and we uh, expect to, uh, we, we think we have some really good candidates in terms of, of landing uh, another uh, investment uh, in that area. With respect to call centers, there, uh, there's two call centers we're currently working with. Uh, there was a meeting uh, last week with the call centers that are currently in the area. Uh, the positive thing is that uh, those call centers are retaining the staff that they have. Uh, the Marriott call center, which uh, moved to uh, having everyone housed in a physical location to having people work out of their homes, is actually working very well. And uh, they, they are looking at hiring more people. So, so that, that, that's working out well. And uh, the one at the research park, I think is pretty close now to uh, full complement of 400 people. In terms of energy and, and clean tech, uh, again, we're seeing some, some activity there. Uh, the changes in the Ontario Green uh, Energy Act and the reduction uh, in the feed-in tariffs uh, has uh, changed some of the activity in, in that area, but we still are seeing some, uh, some activity. And recently, we got a significant inquiry uh, for a company in the, in the solar area. Probably the one area that has uh, garnered the most interest in the last six months uh, has been advanced manufacturing. And we're tracing that to the decline in the Canadian dollar. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, comments in the press uh, with respect to manufacturing not coming back uh, to Ontario because some of the uh, base industry has been, been lost. Uh, I think in automotive now, uh, the automotive industry is, is really humming, but we haven't seen greenfield investment. It's been mainly the plants that are operational. I believe Waterville in, in Petrolia is doing very well, and so is AutoTube out in, in uh, Warwick. Uh, a couple distribution uh, companies have looked at the area. In the area of food processing, we've uh, attended three shows this year. Uh, we're a part of the Ontario Food Alliance. Uh, there's been... Uh, Matthew just came back from, uh, from Germany and also from the PLA show in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, there, there were uh, about 90 meetings in, in total. We were involved in about a third of those meetings. Uh, there's really four uh, prospects that uh, we've identified uh, through that process. And I would say at this point in time, and, and Matthew actually gave a presentation to the SLEP board yesterday, uh, we're probably in the best position in terms of real interest that we've been in in a, in a long time. The thing that's hurting us in terms of food processors is we don't have uh, food grade buildings like many other municipalities in, in Ontario have, and we don't have some of the infrastructure. But in terms of greenfield, in terms of uh, companies that can serve the U.S. market uh, from, uh, from our area, and, and given where the dollar is, uh, it's looking more favorable than it has in the past. 
Uh, in terms of companies that are serving primarily the GTA, uh, we think we have very limited, uh, limited potential. In terms of the chemistry complex, there's a couple major projects that we've been working on. Uh, as members of council know, we uh, retained uh, Palmer Consulting to do a feasibility study uh, looking at uh, how we can take advantage of natural gas here. And what that study ended up focusing on is propane and uh, derivative being polypropylene. Uh, we've had uh, conversations now with uh, a dozen companies in that space, uh, and we've had a couple of good meetings. Uh, the study is still being shopped around. We had a meeting with Nova Gas, or Nova, Camp, Nova Gas, with uh, Union Gas two weeks ago. Uh, they've told us that natural gas prices in our area will be at par uh, with Henry Hub or even below that by 2018, which is very positive. The other thing in terms of propane is that there's no propane pipelines that are running from Marcellus and Utica down to the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, there's a lot of propane in Western Canada. Most of that is not going to come here. It's going to end up going uh, overseas. And last week, there's a company, Williams Energy, that have announced they're going to build a propylene, polypropylene plant in Edmonton. So we, we think that there's still good opportunity in terms of the, the, the propylene side, polypropylene. In terms of the, um, so, and we, I think we did send council members, at least some of you guys, Mayor Arnold, a copy of the, of the study. And what drives the main, the main costs in terms of that propylene plant is feedstock. And that's why we think that as we move forward, we, we have an opportunity here and, and, and based upon the interest that we're getting. And there is uh, increasing global demand uh, for uh, polypropylene. The other major project is the Sugars Project. Uh, this is uh, really being driven uh, with Bioindustrial Innovation Canada, which I'm on the board, and there's also a uh, contractual obligation uh, with SLEP. The objective here is to establish the first cellulistic sugar plant uh, probably in North America. Uh, we've been working with 19 technology providers. Uh, we have Western University and Lampton College involved in this process. Uh, that part of the process in terms of selecting technology provider uh, will wrap up by the end of January. Uh, then we'll be focused on, on the business cases. Uh, we have uh, the best in class uh, international companies involved in this process. And the end goal is to have a sugars plant uh, built here by, by 2018. Just go back here a second. So the MEDI International Media Tour, we had uh, about 15 uh, journalists here uh, from Europe, from China, from South America, from North America, and we've sent out to county council uh, some of the uh, feedback, the articles that are being written globally uh, on the complex. Uh, there's been over a million uh, viewers of those articles. Uh, and if we had to buy the press that we're getting uh, from that, it would be worth millions of, of dollars. So that has been uh, a great partnership uh, with the province in terms of uh, promoting the, uh, the biohybrid chemistry complex. In terms of uh, clean tech, uh, we're still working uh, with Ubiquity Solar. Uh, they are uh, hiring people. They are moving uh, equipment uh, to their site, uh, which is very positive. Uh, we continue to reevaluate that, that uh, sector in terms of how we're going to move forward. Uh, now that we have a, a change in, in the federal government, and uh, try, we're trying to figure out where the province is going in, in terms of, uh, of their, uh, their strategy. Uh, we continue to work with Lampton College. You may be aware that Lampton College recently established a, a new center of excellence for industrial bioproducts and clean energy technology. And we, were, we are working with them on holding uh, two symposiums in uh, 2016, one on energy and, and one on water. In terms of engineering, metal fabrication, and industrial, alliance, industrial uh, bioproducts, uh, we continue to work with the uh, Sarnia Lampton Industrial Alliance. In fact, they had their uh, AGM uh, this week. Uh, they're becoming much more expert oriented. There were three uh, or f 
three major shows internationally that members of the Alliance participated in this year, uh, which, which is very positive. I know uh, Paul Healy and Rick Perdoe just came back uh, from Kuwait from the show over there, and they're very uh, positive and what, what they saw. And at the meeting last week, we had uh, a gentleman from Lamsar who came back from BC and provided uh, an overview to the group on opportunities in BC uh, around the LNG market. We recently uh, released the, uh, an RFP to look at uh, doing the engineering for the oversized load corridor. Uh, we have now signed a contract with MIG Engineering uh, to complete that study, which will be done by March. We also issued an RFP to look at the uh, market opportunities uh, for uh, oversized uh, load pieces. That market study uh, will be um, completed sometime next year. We have identified a company to do the work, and part of that study will look at the size of the market, uh, where the opportunities are in the market, and also look at the competitiveness of our companies in terms of being able to serve that space. And I think that will be critical to us, along with the engineering component, in terms of securing money for the senior, from the senior governments to help put the infrastructure in place uh, in the roads uh, for the oversized load uh, corridor. Agriculture and food processing, I, I think I already made those comments. In terms of marketing, I mean, we tend to, to reach out in, in terms of participating in uh, international trade shows. One of the things that is positive in terms of gaining new recognition for us was our uh, successful uh, making it as a, an intelligent community, uh, top 21 intelligent community. So now uh, we're trying to make it into the top seven. There's an application process that we're going through that we'll be completing over the next uh, two months. And uh, we, we think that, again, that really helps shine a, a different light on us and, and and in terms of rebranding and also beyond the chemistry industry in terms of working to get uh, diversification. In terms of community branding, uh, we continue to uh, engage with community groups. One of the things that we have to do is we have to do a, a better job in terms of reaching out to the municipalities and getting more of the municipalities involved and getting you using the brand. It is an umbrella brand. It's not, represent, it's not made to represent is not made to uh, take away from the brand of any one organization or municipality. It's an umbrella brand for the whole community, all of Lampton County. Uh, we have uh, been successful in hiring uh, a student from Western University as part of the uh, practicum, postgraduate practicum program there for 16 weeks, and that person will be working uh, on the branding uh, come, uh, come January. We've also hired uh, two students uh, with funding from uh, Goodwill who will be updating the business directory also starting uh, in the next couple of weeks. SLEP has been uh, working on redoing our website. Uh, that uh, process will be completed uh, within the next couple of weeks. The one component of it that we're still struggling uh, with is the real estate component. Uh, we have uh, had difficulty with the companies that we've engaged in terms of being able to uh, being able to uh, work with MLS and get the MLS information uh, into the system the way it's supposed to come. So we're looking at how we can uh, how we can resolve that. We continue to pursue uh, social media and and web. Uh, one of the things I guess about social media that we find is social media is good at raising awareness, but it doesn't make the phone ring. Uh, so we, we, we have uh, efforts in that area. We're looking to boost those efforts in, uh, in uh, the new year, but we find that getting on the phone, being at the trade shows, using direct mail, tends to make the phone ring more than social media. In terms of new uh, resident attraction, uh, we have had some success uh, since we spoke with you in, in June. There's been a chemical engineer from Venezuela now studying at Lampton College. Uh, there's been a family from the Dominican Republic that has moved here. Uh, and we also have the uh, Facebook uh, campaign that we've been uh, running on the, on the Spanish uh, network. 
Uh, so far, that's reached 240,000 people. Uh, there's been 11,000 persons visiting the web page, and there's been 20 qualified leads. So we actually are finding that in terms of social media, it's much more effective at targeting people than it is at targeting companies. The other thing with new resident attraction, we have been involved uh, with the uh, Syrian refugees. We did put on a, a seminar uh, a couple of months ago that was very well received, uh, and, and the SLEP board uh, and Judy Morris has taken a, a leadership position in terms of developing an immigration strategy for the community, along with a number of other partners, and we'll be rolling out that, uh, that strategy in the new year. Creative Industries uh, was an area that we put a lot of effort into this year. Uh, we had a, a company that came in and, and did a baseline study. They determined that uh, 4 to 6 percent of Lambton County uh, employment is in the creative industries. We recently had uh, Cobalt Connects that did further work. They identified uh, over 400 firms in the community that are involved in, in the creative industries. They have uh, developed uh, and, and, and working with a creative industry strategy team that we put in place, a strategy that we'll be uh, implementing uh, over, the, over the next year. We have been uh, publishing profiles of successful people uh, in the creative industries. We have put together a, a startup guide for creative industry businesses. We think that there's a good opportunity to leverage opportunities in the creative industry being sandwiched between Detroit and Toronto because both Detroit and Toronto uh, are doing a lot in that sector. In Detroit now, Creative Industries is the third largest employer. And in uh, Sarnia today, there's 160 people that will be here for the next uh, five or six days uh, that will be involved in, in the filming of a, of a major uh, production here. So we are starting to, to see see uh, good things come. We're also seeing more of our uh, social media companies and, and design firms uh, reaching out for opportunities in the Toronto marketplace. And online, uh, if you go online to entrepreneurlink.ca, uh, we have quite a bit of information now that we have put online in terms of promoting the uh, creative sector. In terms of the Business Enterprise Center, uh, we, we've been very uh, busy there. Uh, we've had 1,280 uh, general inquiries for, since uh, April 1st. There's been 22 business startups, and there's 50 people uh, that have uh, been employed as a result of those, uh, those startups. Uh, we're still uh, active uh, in serving on uh, many different organizational boards and, and partnerships with other groups uh, in the community in addition to the specific uh, points that uh, I've made uh, here today. Any questions? been a big supporter of the partnership as you know for years but the world is changing and all we got to do is look to our neighbors in the U.S. and look at a 70 uh, cent Canadian dollar. I look around and I look at other economic uh, organizations such as the Windsor Essex group and the uh, the Waterloo group as well as Perth even when I look at and they're all looking at making big changes to try to capture some of that new market. What kind of changes other than maybe what you've outlined there as I call those soft changes are you and your organization looking at to try to capture some of that U.S. business, that U.S. opportunity um, to grow the community? Uh, again, like I say, I look at the Waterloo model, and they've changed their whole makeup of their board, for example, and they've looked at some other strategic ways. So I'll maybe just throw that out as a question if I could, sir. What we've tried to do is, and what we want to do is, we want to, we need to be focused because we have limited resources. So a shotgun pro approach doesn't work. Uh, I think that if we look at the biohybrid chemistry complex and the energy complex, we're doing well. I think that where we need more changes uh, is in uh, how we identify opportunities for the rural parts of the, of the county. I think that's where we're struggling more, and, and I think that's where we need more di dialogue uh, with the municipalities. I think this year we also made a significant change in, in looking at the uh, creative industries. It was something that we hadn't looked at before. 
And I think that we need to look at uh, some specific opportunities in terms of building infrastructure and, uh, and, and realizing uh, opportunities in that area. Councillor Bruzewitz. Uh, Mr. Malay, when you were talking about the two food processing uh, opportunity prospects, you, you mentioned something about some infrastructure missing link. Can you be fairly specific about it? And the second question I have is, do you see a role for the county council, perhaps in cooperation with private sector to correct this deficiency so we can be competitive and perhaps attract uh, th those interested parties? have any companies in our area that provide freezer services for food processing. Uh, we have very uh, few companies that are involved in, uh, in the uh, distribution uh, side of, of uh, food processing. And, and we have very few companies that are in the food processing business at all. Uh, so that, that's what, and, and some of the other municipalities, their, their uh, water and sewer networks are even designed uh, more for, for food grade operations. So that, th those are some of the, the, the areas and, uh, that, are, that are impacting us. Uh, I guess the question is, and, and one of the things that we're pursuing is going after some of those companies that build uh, the uh, freezing services uh, warehousing services that are geared to that type of sector and see if they have any interest in doing anything here. For starters. The goal of, of county council, I mean, in, in terms of uh, what you can do, I, I need to think a little bit more about what specifically the county council as a whole could do. I, I don't have a good answer for you right now. Councillor Bushy. Uh, from, from your report, apparently you follow the, uh, the number of people who are created for jobs in our community. You said 50 created in, in a certain area and certain um, uh, time. Could you tell me how many, if you can, uh, jobs were created within a year, in 2015, or 2014, 2015? There, there's 50 companies that we work with directly. In, in terms of, that was just a business enterprise center. Just the entrepreneurs that came to, to receive assistance through the enterprise center was, was 50. How many jobs were created in 2015 or 2014? Jobs. Not up my head. No, I can. I, I will get it for you. Councilor <laughs> Now, I know you spent a fair amount of time, and Councilor Bukovich also brought up food processing. You and I have had that discussion for the last ten years. I really think the effort should be put somewhere else because I'm not sure that we're going to be able to pull that off. The other uh, comment I have is, uh, you talked about a sugar plant uh, being up and running in 2018. I have two, two comments. One is, uh, that's only two years away. And where are we getting the feedstock? This past week, and I did spend the intron at the OFA convention, and that whole bio and sugar and growth was uh, discussed with excellent presentation. So uh, where are we on that and how is that really going to happen? Because the logistics of getting transportation is a challenge. Uh, the farming community is involved in that project and uh, they have uh, given assurances that they will be able to provide the tonnages that are needed uh, for the industry given with working with the customers that we're now working with. Councillor Case? Yeah, maybe I just uh, three award them um, to Mr. Millay. Just a follow-up question, extension from my seatmate, uh, Andy's uh, question. A lot of the municipalities, Mr. Millay, as you know, have their own economic development groups in-house. Warwick is one of them. Again, I think some of the problems that we get into and some of the, I guess, the, the situations is that Sometimes you don't know what we're working on, and quite often we don't know what you're working on. 
and it does create a bit of a problem sometimes. And uh, we've had a couple small examples of that over the past few years in Warwick. So I think there needs to be, I, I appreciate your comment about trying to get out there and work closer with the, with the more rural municipalities, because again, we're out there in the game as well. And that's always been one of the hardest things for me to kind of, uh, I guess, wrap myself around. We're out there doing our best to sell Warwick and also sell Lambton, because if something doesn't work in Warwick, we want it to work somewhere else in Lambton County. That's always been the way that this, this uh, body has always tried to work. But we do trip over each other from time to time, and sometimes we don't know what you're working on and you don't know what we're working on. So it's a communication piece. But again, that goes back to, I guess, having sat on the board, understanding and realizing there are certain things you can talk about and can't talk about. So I think there's a real problem there in the communication aspect of things. And I, I do appreciate the fact you say you do want to communicate and have those discussions with local municipalities more often. But we at local municipalities have to communicate too. And everybody's so protective of that, that one nugget that everybody's trying to court that creates a problem. But that's the one th issue I really see. And I'd like to see a better way of doing business between the local municipalities and the partnership. Because sometimes we're tripping over each other and we're not working together and it's not creating any positive uh, news for anybody. So, you know, that's just my point. Thank you. Things that we have discussed is, is having a, an in-camera meeting uh, with members of, of county council uh, where we could discuss in a, in a more open manner uh, some of the prospects that we are uh, working with. Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Warden. Uh, just through you to uh, George, this morning it was announced that uh, Fiat Chrysler was spending a billion dollars in Michigan as part of their uh, economic development, but that came with the assurances that they would get $1.9 billion in uh, tax relief or whatever over the next 15 years. Is that something that you folks uh, look at to see exactly what other jurisdictions are offering for incentives for them to uh, stimulate business and growth in their communities? And if so, uh, would I be able to implore you folks to uh, make a list of what those incentives are that Michigan is offering businesses? Because if that's the people that we're trying to work and uh, have business develop similar, then I think we need to understand what's out there in the marketplace that uh, the folks are offering. And I would also say that it also does uh, vary by sector. So what's available in the automotive industry will be different than what's available in the chemical industry. Uh, from a corporate taxation point of view, uh, Ontario is very competitive. Our corporate tax rate combined is about 26%. A lot of U.S. states are 30 to 35%. Uh, when you factor in the currency difference now with the uh, 75 cent dollar, uh, we're very favorable. The other thing in terms of incentives that you have to be careful on is uh, whether or not you're going to be able to collect the full incentive because more and more uh, U.S. states are putting in place performance contracts as part of their incentives. So while big uh, announcements are made at the front end, uh, we've seen uh, that, that else does, the whole deal doesn't often end up uh, happening. Thank you. Councillor Gillis. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to you, Mr. Millay, with regard to the sugar plant that you're talking about, is that going to be in direct competition or without complement the sugar beet industry that we have right now? Are they looking at a different type of feedstock than the sugar beet industry? And corn, uh, stover. But we have been uh, working with the Ontario Sugar Beet Growers Association with Mark Lumley, and uh, we, uh, we have some prospect that we're pursuing in, in that area as well, and we actually had, had have had some meetings on that over the last couple of weeks. If I may, with regard to, uh, you were talking about propane and the lack of infrastructure here. That's why we are, haven't been successful. We don't have the pipeline capacity. For propane. Uh, Plains Midstream have a fractionation plant here, uh, and that plant uh, can make about 100,000 pounds and uh, about half of that's going to, to out, out of town. Uh, so the opportunity really is around uh, building a polypropylene plant and looking how we can get more propane, enough propane to uh, provide for a full-scale polypropylene plant is really what it's all about. 
Then, sorry, um, you. I was under the understanding that we didn't have the right product coming in uh, due to lack of uh, pipeline capacity. Is that you were mentioning that there was a, a propylene plant that went in in Edmonton? I'm in Western Canada. There's lots of propane. Some of that propane now is coming here by rail car. There's not likely to be a pipeline plant built to bring propane from Western Canada to Lambton County because it makes more economic sense for them to ship it overseas. And recently, uh, Williams have announced they're going to build a propylene plant in Edmonton, which will also take away some of that market. In our area, there's a number of pipelines that are being proposed uh, to bring more natural gas and natural gas liquids to Lambton County. The best opportunity will be the Utopia pipeline, which is a Kinder Morgan pipeline that's planned to be operational by 2018. If we can get enough propane through that pipeline, then that will give an advantage, feedstock advantage, to Lambton County project. So that that happens. So, uh, the, the, so, so there's a couple things. There's working with uh, existing propane suppliers here. There's reaching out to those uh, other uh, pipeline companies. And then it's also working uh, the, with the companies that could be interested in building uh, a propane uh, polypropylene plant because they may build their own pipeline. So it's being attacked on multiple fronts. Councillor Marriott. Thank you, Warden. Through to you, to uh, Mr. Millay. Uh, George, you mentioned with the conversation with Councillor Arnold about what he brought up with uh, being competitive, and you said that uh, the, the corporate tax rate was lower in Ontario, but what about taking in all the other factors, like uh, hydro, um, the environmental standards compared to many of the, the states? Like, when you factor everything in, um, there's, I think that's the problem why we don't have new industry is because of when you, tax rate is just one, one uh, issue. Things. In terms of hydro, hydro itself, Michigan doesn't have cheap hydro. There are some uh, U.S. states and some Canadian locations that do have cheap hydro. Uh, Michigan hydro isn't what I'd call cheap hydro. Um, in terms of uh, one of the issues uh, is right-to-work legislation, which Michigan does have and a number of other U.S. jurisdictions do have. There is no question that there are manufacturing uh, plants that will not even consider a location that's not right to work. Uh, so that is one thing that does uh, come up. Um, in terms of uh, looking at, at projects, I think you need to look at each project uh, on, a cost, on, 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 on its own merits because it also depends on uh, where the raw materials are coming from that company, where are the customers? What's the means of transportation? So each location decision uh, is really uh, where are the customers based on it on its own merit. But overall, I would say that we are very competitive uh, with with Michigan. The one thing that Michigan uh, has done in the past, they they have been willing to put a wider range of grants on the table. Uh, and have bought their way into certain markets that Ontario uh, has been reluctant to do. Questions? Seeing none? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Malay, for your presentation today. Next, I would ask that uh, Mr. Gord Lazinger, uh, Mr. Mike Service of Wilsondale Asset Management, and Mr. Marty Raymakers from MIG Engineering, uh, to come forward to speak to County Council uh, with an introduction to themselves and some insight in regards to the current progress and outline of the future plans for Bayside Mall. What's well, just Gord? Oh, just you, Gord? Okay. Okay. 
I've just been advised that Mr. Uh, Lassinger is looking after the presentation on behalf of his group. Good morning. Um, Warden uh, Bev McDougall, uh, Mayor Mike Bradley, whose staff have been a great assistance to us, along with, uh, along with the warden's staff, counselors, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having us here this morning. I have with me today um, two people, Mike Service, who's our general manager of Bayside Center, and Marty Raymaker, who has been a key part of our team since we landed here about three months ago. It seems that uh, Marty and I uh, talk uh, many times uh, each day on matters that are important to us and important, I think, to the continued revitalization of downtown Sarnia. Ido Ferreira, Ferreira, my partner, is unfortunately <laughs> recovering from the flu, and I thought it uh, best, and as did he, that we not transport his germs to Sarnia today. So, um, so with that, let's uh, move on. We closed on, um, we closed on the purchase of the Bayside Center October the 8th, which is about seven weeks ago tomorrow. Tomorrow will be full, a full seven weeks. Uh, on that day, we uh, took the liberty of paying back uh, John Innes some $385,000 that he'd, he'd uh, graciously lent to a, a cash-strapped receiver, I understand. And, uh, and on that same day, uh, we undertook to engage a company that would put a new roof over the county's uh, long-neglected uh, headquarters in Sarnia. And, uh, and I'm pleased to announce, I think it's this Friday, that they're actually moving the material, starting to move the material on site to replace that roof at, uh, at a cost of, to us of something in excess of half a million dollars. But it will be a better roof. It will provide a um, little over R25 insulation compared to the current one, which probably is closer to 10 or 11. And, uh, and it's the first of a number of initiatives we're taking to try to modernize and, um, and frankly, bring current uh, the Bayside Center. In 2016, we will undertake a study in conjunction with Mr. Ennis's staff to consider replacement of the escalators, which have been very troublesome, but which, thankfully, I understand are working reasonably well now. Um, but we are looking at it, we're looking at potentially replacing those with, with elevators. But we'll, we'll look at both and decide what the best thing to do. There's a long list of smaller items, particularly eight new HVAC units uh, on top of the mall that need to be replaced. In the past seven weeks, we have uh, purchased, um, let's see, five other properties and have offers out on three more. And most of these have the objective of trying to open up the Bayside Center, which is largely hidden behind a wall of buildings on Christina, so we can open it up to the, so the traveling public can see the center. Um, last week, we also um, purchased the Drawbridge Inn. And we, while it's different than the Bayside Center, it's, uh, it's part of our effort to try to catch up with what's been going on in downtown Sarnia. There's been a lot of revitalization going on, and uh, we saw it as, uh, I, I, knew the, I knew the Drawbridge Inn from, the, I guess, 2007, 2008, and uh, I was disappointed to see the state it was in. And we reached out to the uh, owners of it who are in Alberta. They're absentee. They live in, I think, Medicine Hat. And um, we came to a, an agreement. So the Bayside Center is, uh, is of course, just, uh, just north of the Bayside Mall, which is, this is a historic map, which, interestingly, in the northwest quadrant of this map, uh, the northwest corner was the town hall of the city of Sarnia back then, or the, well, I'm not sure it was the city. It was probably the town back then, because this map goes back a long ways, 1893. And, uh, and just north of it, on the other side of Christina, uh, was the drawbridge. It was the site of the county offices. They were apparently on the west side of Christina, just north of, uh, just north of George. And so now we have properties that were the sites of both the city and the county. 
this, of course, is just a current aerial photo, which I'm sure you've all seen from time to time. Okay, so this is, this is an overview, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here, but this just gives you an ov overview of a, con of a conceptual redevelopment plan for Bayside. It's not the final plan because we're having a number of meetings with stakeholders in the community, including uh, December 2nd, a week today, I guess it is a week today, in the evening at the art gallery, at the county art gallery. Um, and at that time, we'll receive hopefully more input on how to best develop the holding that we acquired uh, consistent with uh, and to make it, to make it catch up with the rest of downtown Sarnia. I'll go into this in a little detail now. So um, on our efforts to secure a better place for the, for the center, we are pursuing a major grocery anchor for the south end of the mall. We're looking at a number of key retailers, including a major drugstore. Uh, we think in, over time there'll be artisan shops and boutique shops going in, specialty service providers, and we want to extend the usage of the underground parking because it is a significant, I think, attribute for downtown Sarnia if it's in fact open and available. So that's what we will be doing shortly. We're working on the food court restaurants. Well, we're, we're modernizing the food court shortly, and we're looking at additional restaurants. We're, you can see in purple here a location for a restaurant uh, coming out to Christina Street, and I'll get, and it could have a rooftop patio. It's one thing we're looking at. And we're looking at a North End Cafe up by, um, up right at the North End, close to George Street. We're looking at some complementary uh, buildings to be put adjacent to the center. Uh, at the North End on uh, Vital, we're looking at a potential seniors lifestyle apartment complex of 10 to 12 stories. And at the south end, on top of the, what we call, what Mighty calls Big Red, uh, we're looking at uh, some unique lop condos. We're right now doing the stu structural assessment of the building to determine what it can actually hold. I was a little dismayed to learn that the third floor of that building got blown off in a tornado, so this time it'll have to be a little better engineered, but uh, hopefully that'll happen. Um, on the office and institutional side, we talked a bit about some things we're doing to improve um, improve the, the county's offices. We'll, I'll get to more in a moment. We're looking at we're looking at some other complementary office tenants, particularly on the medical side, and particularly if we put a seniors facility in. So that is being pursued. We don't have anything to share at this point, but uh, hopefully we will shortly. On the transportation side, we've got a number of uh, initiatives underway. First, I want to talk a little bit about the garage. We are, we're going to do some minor things like pressure cleaning and line painting because it's pretty worn out. We're going to be painting the garage. We're going to be lightening it up in the inside so that it's a safe, safer place for people to, particularly pedestrians, to walk in. Uh, we may be doing things like speed bumps because there's a fairly long run that people can take, particularly if you go from the north end towards the county down towards the exit. Uh, there's been the odd person, I'm told, over time that's been going a little fast in there. So we're looking at ways of slowing that down. We're going to try to bring it into the 21st century with some electric vehicle charging stations. And uh, we're going to be investing in upgrading the accessibility uh, in the up in the mall area and in the garage area because there's some areas that are not that accessible for some people. On the streetscape, we want to do a fair bit on landscaping, but that'll come with acquiring property. But we're looking at uh, some streetscaping down the southwest corner. We're looking at some up in the northwest corner. We're looking at a Lockheel Street link and a Market Square uh, gathering place. So this is a... Um, this is an overview of uh, a, a big red, as I call it, down the southwest corner with a new, a new parkette, a new market square, or a new piazza, depending on how you, what, how you prefer to, uh, to, to think about it. We've acquired two of the three buildings. <laughs> There's a small bar that we haven't yet acquired, but 
We have active discussions going on this morning, so hopefully that will happen. Um, this is just one artist's rendering of what it could look like with, uh, with Big Red on the right-hand side and a new restaurant on the left and the, just, a, just the words grocery to indicate that in behind there will be whatever it ends up being. And it won't, be just, it won't just say grocery, it'll say some name that we'll all recognize, hopefully. And this is another view from, uh, this is, yeah, this is from uh, the existing structure, which has turned, been turned into a cafe, looking across at, uh, at the Taylor building on the right-hand side. And this is some possible seating concepts for the mall, for the, for the square. So the, the idea here is to, uh, is to open up the Bayside Center to Christina. So this is one concept. <laughs> There's a few buildings missing from this concept. One would be the RBC Bank. Um, but you'll notice there's some blue over in the mall, so that's possibly where RBC could end up. Uh, obviously, uh, the mayor and I had a discussion about this, and you know we're going to, uh, if we're successful in getting the RBC building, that'll be contingent on them moving into the mall. And, uh, and, but we have to get another building right beside the RBC building. So, so for now, this is a bit of a dream, but we'll see. Uh, this is what it would sort of look like from an aerial view if the RBC and the building beside it are maintained. But the two buildings to the south of the former byway building, well, one is purchased and the other is, is well, we have a handshake on it. The, the, one of the owners has been quite ill and just recently passed away, so the, there's no rush to, to buy it, but we will buy it. Um, so we, what, would we, what do we have going on? We've got some stakeholder, stakeholder consultation going on on the evening of December 2nd, to which you're all invited, and hopefully you're all aware of that by, by now. It uh, starts at 5.30 p.m., it'll probably be open at 5.00 goes to about 8 p.m. We'll have a little presentation at 6.30, which will largely look like this. Um, but there'll be an opportunity to talk to us one-on-one -on -one about what you think and how we can improve. There'll be a public consultation component. We're going to have a survey for a handout at the, uh, at the session, which Marty's group is organizing. And, uh, and we'll get some feedback through an online uh, response. And I, I anticipate we'll have future meetings with the stakeholders in downtown Sarnia. And of course, we have ongoing municipal consultation with the city of Sarnia. There have been staff and legal staff and planning staff and the county of Lambton facility staff have all been very generous with their time. Um, so that is uh, that will continue, I hope. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lazinger, for your presentation, Council. Is there anyone with any questions? Councillor Knapper. Yeah, what is the timeline on the, the high rises and stuff like that? They were very interesting. Um, well, right now, we haven't made any application to anyone, and we've just hired, uh, we just have a, an architect involved, a local architect, David Gilchrist, who's doing some conceptual sketches for us. I would think we would be able to move to plans and planning applications, site plan approvals, that kind of thing, in the latter half of 2016. I think the first half of 2016, we'll be figuring out what the right thing to do is. We have done certain things. For instance, we've done, before we even closed on the mall, we did a, we had a company out of Toronto do a senior study for us of, of required residences, that, if you will, the need within the city of Sarnia. And what is the unmet need and the unmet need was about 1,000 residents. So on that basis, putting in 150, it's, it's fine. You know, there's lots of unmet need. There should be a good market for it. So we've done some work, but we haven't done enough work yet on the physical side of what a building will look like, just the conceptual side. But it's only been seven weeks. Councillor Gillis and then Councillor Bruzewitz. Uh, thank you, Madam Morton. Thank you, Mr. Lassinger, for your presentation. You've given me a certain level of comfort uh, being on Sarnia City Council. And when we heard uh, who was buying the building, and without any information of what you were going to do, we were a little, little concerned. But uh, you've certainly um, 
with what you've shown us here today, uh, those, those concerns are somewhat alleviated. I'm uh, pleased with your, uh, you do have a very aggressive timeline. I'm pleased to see that you're moving along and hoping that uh, we can do whatever we can at the city and at the county to make this a huge success because we need it. Well, we may have an aggressive timeline. I think we need to catch up with the rest of the downtown. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Bruzewitz. Uh, Mr. Ashton, you, you moved at a speed that I did not anticipate. And you mentioned you, you concluded some transactions. Some of them are still... So how many pieces are you missing right now to... to, to well, BC, which we'll see if we get that. But if you include that, we're missing one, two. We're missing three on Christina. Well, a four, four on Christina, if you include the understanding we have with, with the coin shop, the owner of the coin shop, which is just south of RBC, we, ha we have an understanding, so I, I believe we'll conclude that very shortly. So it's three pieces on Christina and uh, one on Vital. Some uh, past dev redevelopment proposals in different parts of the city that the whole redevelopment was basically hijacked by one part of property. So if you're missing some of those, it may be meaning some changes, but, uh, but you still, you know, the concept of it is it's not derailed. Just to deal with that point. Um, while you couldn't see it in the level of detail today, I'm sure you couldn't. For instance, the senior's residence on vital does not require the acquisition of the last parcel in order for us to proceed. We have enough land there to do it without it, so we don't need it. We just, we'll just take it if we can get it, because it'll improve the look of the place, I think. Um, the piazza to be built to the south uh, near, um, near the Taylor building does not absolutely require the acquisition of the, the bar that's remaining. Uh, we, could deal, we, could, we could build that piazza and it would look substantially the way it looks now without it. We just have to reorient what we were going to do at the face of the Taylor Building, the north side of the Taylor Building. We wouldn't be able to do. That's all. But the rest of the piazza would be done. So they're not critical. I think the most critical ones are more up at the northwest corner, the RBC and the other, because that would really open up the north end of the mall to get those big buildings out of the way. Big in terms of landmass, not tall. <laughs> but it'll still be good without it, and it could be done over time. Uh, one particular piece of property has to deal with the owners passing away. Did you say that? Yes, I did. I beg your pardon? Hall or the coin shop, is it? No. He's, he passed away? Oh, okay. I'm relieved. Because... <laughs> I was told his wife. Thank you very much. Councillor, are there any further questions for Mr. Lazinger? Okay, so December 2nd, I believe I heard you say you're doing another presentation at 6.30 and there'll be opportunities for any additional or further questions then if there's anyone uh, uh, with any additional questions after this. Thank you very much. Next, I'm going to uh, call forward Sander Whiting, who is the president of the Lake Smith Conservationists, who would like to speak to County Council today regarding the Lake Smith Cairn project. Ms. Whiting. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present our proposal to you. I am Sandra Whiting, president of the Lake Smith Conservationists. Lake Smith Conservationist is a group of 150 members, which was established in 1992 to assist with the deer and vehicle collisions and the deer decimation of the farm crops in the Pinery area. Since that time, we have supported the community with bird, 
bat and butterfly box school programs, pavilions at Klondike Soccer Field and Pinery Park, area skating, hockey and baseball programs, forest busy bee and caring quilter groups. In 2017, we will be celebrating 25 years of service to the community. We would like to celebrate also the broader history of this unique geological area of the former inland lakes of Burwell, George, and Smith. The wildlife and landscape that was and continues to appear each spring with the return of the swans migration and its future as farmland or a natural wetlands one day. Over the past 30 years, the Lambton Heritage Museum has celebrated the annual migration of the tundra swans and the related history of this natural wonder. The Lake Smith conservationists are proposing a three-year project to commemorate and celebrate the human and natural history of the Lake Smith story. Starting with the 60th anniversary of Dr. Gordon Hagmeyer's draining of the lake in 1955 and ending with the 25th anniversary of the founding of Lake Smith Conservationists in 2017. The project will help celebrate a great story and will enhance the visitor experience year round. It will bring together partners in the community, which in turn will enhance the goals of the County of Lambton's many strategic directions. We are requesting County Council support in this endeavor to construct a park, parking area, and commemorative stone cairn with a brass plaque, excuse me, celebrating the legacy of Dr. Gordon Hagmeyer and the draining of the Lake Smith in 1955. This would be undertaken in phases over the next two years. It would be sited on the Heritage Museum's property, adjacent to the museum walking trail on the Greenway Road, with an entrance off of Goose Marsh Line. The parquet would include interpretive panels which would provide the background and story via Wi-Fi or radio signal interface. The final phase would be construction of a gravel parking area off of the Greenway Road on the County Road Allowance. This area will be in the middle of Old Lake Smith at the point of prime viewing for the public. It would ensure cars and visitors have a safe place off of the shoulder to park and view the wildlife during the annual month-long migration. The Council of Lambton Shores have endorsed the project in principle in October 2014, and our potential partners in the community, the Hagmeyer family, Pinery Park, Asable Bayfield Conservation Authority, and the Lambton Shores Nature Trails Committee have all shown interest in making this project a success. This project supports county goals, with county staff in both cultural services and public works to conceptualize this project, oh, excuse me, county goals to enhance our natural and human history. We have engaged in preliminary discussions with county staff in both cultural and public works to conceptualize the project. Provided there be no fundamental concerns on the outline presented, we request that staff in their capacity be permitted to continue to work with Lake Smith and report back to committee and council as required to further the project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whiting. Uh, council, is there any member with any questions about the project? Okay. Councillor Weber. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, at Lambton Shores uh, has uh, supported this in principle. Are you looking for a request from county to support it in principle as well, or, or uh, yes. is that because I would uh, make a motion that we support this uh, in principle and look for what next steps are, and have staff prepare reports on next steps. The staff, like we, we work with the museum staff and we work with the, uh, the county staff here, just allow us to work together because, I mean, it's not our property. We can't go forward until we, we can work together with, uh, with the partners. And so that's what we're asking for today is the opportunity to be able to um, go to the museum and, and discuss with them and the people here. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ms. Whiting. 
Next, I'm going to uh, call forward Ms. Lisa Daniels, curator of the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery, who would uh, like to make a visual overview of the Beaverbrook exhibition images um, that demonstrate children's group participation, reaction from visitors, lecture programs, and other matters to County Council this morning. Lisa, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Warden McDougall. County Council, thank you for the opportunity to share a midpoint update on the status of the community activity around the masterworks from the Beaverbrook Art Gallery exhibition. But before I share the visual images that represent our community programming goals and achievements, I would like to take a minute and provide a quick update on a few of the statistics that were provided in the November 18th information report to Council. Those stats were as, as of October 31st. And in the past three weeks, as of this past Sunday, there have been an additional 2,634 visitors to the exhibition. So there's now a total of 6,931 visitors that have attended the gallery. There has also been an additional $6,196.46 in the Give What You Can donation boxes in the gallery. So the total um, there is now sitting at $18,113.46. In addition, in the last three weeks, there have been 322 volunteer hours donated. So in total, 821 hours of volunteers. In addition to these quantitative goals that were set for the exhibition, we also set community experience and engagement goals. In a nutshell, JNAG set out to provide a robust and full range of opportunities for the community to engage with the exhibition from a variety of perspectives. To achieve this, a full range of opportunities that would appeal to a broad demographic and to a variety of interest was developed and it is being delivered. Events and receptions that include groups like the Chamber of Commerce Business After Five event, corporate Christmas receptions, as well as many private gatherings such as surprise birthday parties and high school reunions are taking place. These opportunities, which are revenue generating, have been very popular and the gallery is booked to capacity for these types of events until the new year. Building community partnerships is always a focus at the gallery. The perfect fit for this exhibition was a month-long Do It Like Dally Movember series of activities. The, Na the, Movember, the JNAG Movember team consists of 34 people from the community and we have partnered with over 10 local businesses to offer a series of events aimed at raising awareness and money for men's health, all inspired by Salvador Dali, a featured artist in the exhibition. Movember events have included Shave the Date, complete with straight razors and a barbershop quartet, a series of JNAG team events on the various November 1st Fridays, and the final event is being held this Saturday evening at the Refined Fool Brewing Company, who have uh, brewed a special Do It Like Dally beer just for the event, and tickets are still available. Families are engaged through the weekly Family Sunday program, Family Sundays are one of our most popular programs and they provide many families with a regular time in their week to enjoy one another. It is also a wonderful opportunity for intergenerational contact. The children and youth programs have been sold out and include PD days for professional development days for six to 12 year olds and raw youth workshops for 13 to 18 year olds. Our Inspired Memories program is one of our seniors programs that is offered in partnership with the Alzheimer's Society of Sarnia and provides a powerful experience for people with early onset dementia and their caregivers. 
Active Through Art is a program that we receive funding from uh, the federal government for, offers active seniors a series of six programs over the course of the exhibition, encouraging creative social opportunities. Each program is designed to facilitate engagement with the exhibition in unique and fun ways. Arranging Beauty included a tour of that of um, at work that focused on the floral themes that were found in the paintings, after which the group worked with the coordinator of the floral designer from the Royal Botanical Gardens in Toronto to create their own art-inspired floral masterpieces. There are ample opportunities for intergenerational sharing over the course of the exhibition. Here, high school students who participate in the specialist high school's made high skills major program are brought together with seniors participating in our Active Through Art program. Participants view and hear about the artworks that depict stories from the past. Then they team up in pairs, share their unique stories with each other, and then represent those stories through visually guided activities. An engaging and thought-provoking lecture series featuring presenters from the National Gallery of Canada, from Washington and Lee University in Virginia, and from the Beaverbrook Art Gallery has been sold out and very well received. Events like Art After Dark build community by providing opportunities to come together and socialize around art, music, food, and learning. The first event was filled to capacity, and we expect the same for the second Art After Dark event, which will be held in January. Our team of volunteers have been kept very busy, offering a full range of tours for the community. They offer red dot tours, a 15-minute drop-in tour that focuses on one to, two, th one to three paintings or a specific artist, to one-hour fully guided tours, to simply being in the space and available to answer specific questions a visitor might have. Our security guards have become accidental tour guides and are contributing to the visitor experience by answering questions as well and also ensuring the artwork is safe. Our volunteer docents have designed wonderfully engaging tours for children from elementary through to high school, as well as for, very, for special interest groups like the Boys and Girls Club and the Girl Guides. <clears throat> After two months, the exhibition is on track to meet the goals that were set by the steering committee. As you can see by the level of community engagement and by the positive comments and feedback, the positive visitor experience is generating a real sense of community pride for Lambton County residents. And in the visitors from outside of Lambton County, I think the experience is generating positive perceptions about our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Daniels, for your presentation. Uh, questions starting with Councillor Case, then McGugan, please. <laughs> yeah, Madam Warden, through you to Ms. Daniels. It's great. I think you guys have done an absolutely terrific job. You've attracted the people, but I have to ask the question on the financial side. Are we meeting our financial expectations along with the other expectations with the crowds and everything? Maybe I'll ask Mr. Ennis that question through you, Madam Warden. The, the, the best answer to that, uh, Councillor Case, is uh, as we indicated in the third quarter variance review, uh, the gallery uh, is on track uh, to uh, achieve a reasonable result for the year that does take into account uh, the projected uh, revenues uh, that are coming from donations and other sources associated with uh, this uh, particular installation. Councillor Case. Yeah, and that's very good news as well. Uh, Madam Warden, back to Mr. Innes. Mr. Innes, did we not have a dollar amount? I, I'm going by memory, it's a while ago, of what we wanted to achieve on out-of-the-box sort of maybe opportunities financially with the gallery. We talked about some promotional stuff. I remember when I was warden, there were some discussions about that. I'm kind of wondering on that, and again, I'm not trying to dampen the spirit of this whole thing. It sounds like it's gone very well, and I, I, I think that's absolutely terrific. But on the financial side, I do have to ask that question as a due diligence piece. Mr. Ennis? 
Uh, yes, there were budget um, no, object, or, um, objectives that were placed for that. Uh, I must admit that I don't have those numbers on uh, the tip of my tongue, but uh, I will make sure that uh, we do the analysis and we provide that information to Council as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Ennis. Uh, Councillor McGugan. Thank you, Madam Ward and County Council. Uh, through you to uh, Ms. Daniels, uh, first I want to say thanks for the excellent job that you've done there. Uh, even in the very far side of uh, Lambton County, very rural, I've even had some people that are not, I hate to use the word culturally brilliant, but they have gone there and they have really enjoyed it. My question is, how have you reached into the U.S. and with the exchange in the dollar, it's basically a free deal. Have we received a lot of Americans? Ms. Daniels? Thank you. Um, we've been partnered with uh, Tourism Sarnia Lambton since the beginning of the project over the past year and a half, two years. We have um, joined them uh, in leveraging their existing uh, promotions that they do across Ontario as well as into the U.S. In addition to that, um, a joint grant was applied for and received with TSL that allowed us allowed TSL to specifically um, market into the U.S., into Michigan. Um, I have asked Marlene, to, uh, Marlene from TSL is tracking that information, and I don't have a clear picture of that uh, at this point, but that will certainly be part of the, um, the final report. We are um, able to capture... Um, where people are coming from, not each and every individual person, but we are certainly receiving visitors from the U.S. Um, I, I can look at the report. At the, at the report in November 18th, I believe it was around 2% of our visitors were coming from U.S. and outside of Ontario. Um, we expect that to increase as the, the real push into the U.S. started, um, I believe, at the midpoint in October. So we expect there to be more. Council, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your update. Good work. Next, Council will move on to uh, Item 9, Minutes of Council, Open and Closed Session. Uh, looking um, the minutes uh, dated November 4th, 2015, Open and Closed Session, and Special Meeting of Council, Open Session, Closed Session, dated November 18th, 2015. Look for motions. Councillor Gillis, second by Councillor Merritt. That's to move them all as a group. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Okay, item 10, correspondence to uh, receive and file. There's three items before you today. Uh, Council, what is your wish? Receive and file by Councillor McCharles, a second by Councillor Bucci. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? A motion is carried. Items not requiring a motion. We have a report from Tourism Sarnia Lambton, um, their annual gen re general report dated October of 2015, noting there wasn't a presentation today because uh, um, Ms. Woods has. Uh, Intention to come here, I believe, in the new year, perhaps in February, to update Council. Motion on that report, perhaps, to receive and file. Moved by Councillor Bruzewitz, second by Councillor McGugan. All those in favour? Opposed? That motion's carried. Reports requiring a motion. Um, item A, uh, a report from Sarnia Lampton Economic Partnership regarding the Bitumen Energy Refinery Project funding. And there is a motion with respect to that. Looking for Council's wish in that matter. Has everybody been able to find them? Councillor McGugan. I would move that. Okay. Moved by Councillor McGugan. Second by Councillor Cook. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? 
That motion is carried. Second report is from Infrastructure and Development Services Division, uh, report dated November 25th, regarding the gateway sign funding. Uh, there is a motion with that, looking for Council's direction. Councillor Weber moves, second by Councillor Gillis. Any discussion on that motion? Councillor Knapper. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ward McDougall. That $10,000, couldn't a request, uh, RFP go out and include that in it to ask for uh, uh, a sign that somebody designed themselves? Why are we paying $10,000 to somebody to design as a sign? Let's have a little competition on or something. Um, I see that Mr. Cole is in the gallery. Uh, we did have some committee discussion about that. Uh, Mr. Cole, would you like to come forward and talk about the rationale around the 10,000 and how you propose going about managing it? To the microphone, I guess, if it works. Go ahead. Um, Warden uh, and uh, Council Napper. So the decision uh, at the committee, well, we did discuss many different alternatives to bring forward some uh, visual concepts back to Council and into the committee itself. And um, I think uh, uh, there's, we recognize that there were many professional firms that do this work. Um, and some of them may be the, in the industry themselves. So determining exactly how we get these signs that may be part of a larger opportunity to go forward with a, you know, a design build or a, um, uh, they could continue forward with the, the RFP to do the actual uh, structural and, and, and construction design of the sign. But uh, we, we recognize that we need to get somebody in to actually show us, uh, um, uh, show us some visual representation of the design concepts that we have in mind. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Warden. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I think I made the motion to do this a few years ago, and the in initial funding was around $20,000 to do the entire project, and it seems to have taken a life of its own. And uh, when we're talking a quarter of a million dollars and, and uh, 10000 to do a design work, especially when there's all kinds of examples up and down the 400 series highways. The original intention was to uh, have something that looked like some of the ones down on uh, the 401 that uh, showed the county logo and welcome to Lambton County and that's all it was supposed to be. And the whole project at that time when we did uh, preliminary estimate was going to be $20,000 and I wish we'd go back to that. I don't. It wasn't never an intention to uh, spend a fortune on this type of a project. It was just to have something better than the wooden sign that kept fading out and you couldn't see it when you came along the 402. So I don't know. I don't know if you need a motion to that effect, but there is one already on the floor. And But that was the original intent of doing this. It wasn't to uh, have a project that took off on its own and, and cost us literally, you know, 1% of the county budget to do this work. Thank you, Councillor Arnold. Are there any more comments or questions from Council? Okay, we have a motion on the floor that was moved by Councillor Weber, seconded by Councillor Gillis. All those in favour then of the motion before us? All in favour? Opposed? So that motion fails. Deputy Warden Veen. Yes, I don't know if, if this is out of procedure, but I, there is one more comment. We should, whatever we're going to do about this sign, we should do it. And it's, it's nothing against um, 
uh, Watford, but their sign is a lot bigger than ours. And, and when you drive into Lambton County, I, I, I think something should be done fairly soon because the little sign that we got there that says, welcome to Lambton County, it, I think it's about time that it goes. So we, I, I would urge council that, that we do something here. Thank you. Have you a motion, Deputy Warden Bean? Uh, no, I don't have a motion. Councillor Arnold. Warden McDougall, I'll make a motion that uh, we have our staff do a preliminary design and of what it could look like. Very basic county logo, welcome to Lambton County, something done uh, out of uh, brick and stone and then go out get a, a price on that. They make do signs all the time here in this county and, and these guys are pretty sharp and I think they have enough ingenuity between the bunch of them to be able to make that happen. Gordon Bean, discussion from council on that? Okay. All those in favor of that motion? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. Finally, uh, Council, there is a report before you today from Finance Facilities and Court Services with respect to a emer new emergency medical service base in Forest. And there is a motion at the end of that report. <coughs> Councillor Bradley? I'm not moving, I just have some questions. Staff, I'll recognize that. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Moved by Councillor Gillis. Second by Councillor Cook for discussion. Go ahead, Councillor Bradley. Uh, who, who is um, who's responsible for the project? Who's answering the questions on the project? of the project uh, has been coordinated through uh, Howard Lucas, our uh, purchasing uh, manager. Uh, the, uh, the input to it, as usual, came from EMS staff and uh, through uh, Mr. Taylor's offices as well. Uh, the reason that uh, we are presenting the report today is because uh, <clears throat> one of our responsibilities for the purchasing is to uh, bring forward the final recommendation with regards to uh, the actual whether or not to accept the proposal that has been brought forward to us. And as uh, there were uh, issues with uh, the costing of the project and everything else, uh, and we were the ones who were providing the <clears throat> potential solution for that, uh, we are the ones who have authored the report. But it was the actual design parameters, in other words, what are the needs of the EMS uh, uh, service for the, the new base in force, that came from Mr. Taylor and his staff. We just simply went through the process of retaining the parties and seeking the responses to the proposals. Yes, there's two questions. One is, um, I didn't see anything in here about the competence of the organization that's being awarded the contract and whether the counties had past history. But the other issue is, um, and this, I almost hate to be in this position, by trying to stay within that budget range, are you doing a disservice to the service in the next 5, 10, 20 years? I mean, any time you scope down the buildings, I see it so many times, and then it's regretted. It's regretted because what you've done is you've, you've scoped it down so far that you've just got what you need for today. And I noted that with the OBP office and everything else. And again, I'm not advocating to spend more money, but it, I just want to make sure that if this is approved, that it's not just for today, it's for the next five, ten years. It, and it will work in the long term. Count, uh, uh, Mr. Ennis, you wanted to comment on that? Uh, you'll recall in the report that we talked about the $67,000 worth of savings. Quite frankly, uh, when uh, Mr. Lucas... <clears throat> approached uh, the uh, the builders for that um, uh, the or the low bidder on it 
uh, we told them that we were actually looking for closer to a quarter of a million worth of reductions. And, uh, but we also said to them, we have to make sure that the functionality of the base is retained. In other words, that all of the features that were uh, necessary for it to not only serve EMS now but into the future had to be retained. So where were we achieving the savings? We did some minor changes to uh, the uh, garage doors. We did minor, we did changes to the type of heating that's in the bays. Uh, so what we did was we looked at areas where we could, you know, instead of going leading edge, we uh, dialed it back a bit to something that was still going to serve the purpose but was going to uh, reduce the cost for us. So we believe that those $67,000 worth of uh, savings that have been proposed do not compromise the functionality of the base. And we were very clear that we could not do that. Uh, there were other uh, reductions that were suggested to us, but they would have compromised uh, the, uh, the ability of the base going forward, so they were rejected. And when we found that that was all we could find in the way of cost savings, that's when we started to look at how do we uh, address the need to increase the financing available for this project and still try and bring it in within a reasonable envelope uh, for Council's consideration. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cook, then Councillor McGugan. Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, just through you to... Uh, I guess whoever the project manager is, regarding the $96,000 from the OPP, was that a request from the OPP to retract that option from the design, or is this just coming from the county to cut our costs down? Mr. Ennis, again, please. Uh, you know, I'm the architect of the, of the solution, so um, I'm going to be answering those types of questions. Um, when we were looking at the base going forward, the, the intent was always that if we were going to house the OPP that uh, we would use the revenue coming from uh, having them come into the building to finance that portion of it. So what we were doing here is we were trying to, in, the, in you know, full disclosure, identify to council, this was the portion of the cost that is going to be covered from the, the OPP. It is not a lump sum uh, contribution up front. What it is is that we will carry it on our books as a, as a unfinanced capital outlay, and then as the rents come in, uh, once the OPP are in place, we will reduce that going forward. And the idea behind it is, is that we're, we wanted to make clear that we're not looking to finance the cost of that from the original financing that was put in place. Follow-up, Mr. Cook? Thank you, Madam Morton. Uh, so just to follow, just so we get this straight, so the OPP are if they were going to be moving their location or that was not proposed to move the location to this? This is just for coming from somewhere? Mr. Ennis. Mr. Taylor has had uh, conversations with the OPP and I think I will defer to him to answer that question better. That's correct. So <clears throat> this um, project from the outset, um, when it was endorsed by council, it was always made clear to staff that um, to search for partnerships, we successfully done that with OPP, and to date we've uh, been in dialogue with OPP over their requirements and their inclusion in the project. Um, we just don't have any formal um, agreements with regards to costs at this point, but they are included in the scope, and there's a mechanism, as was described, to to keep them included. So their needs in the this area are to have visibility. Um, in, in, Lamp, in the county in that area and a presence in forest and, and that's how they're included in the, the scope of the project. So it, it's quite positive it's, and it's a terrific partnership for both agencies and the use of the facility has many benefits uh, going forward so we're quite excited to uh, land that partnership at this point. Mr. Cook, or Councillor Cook, sorry. sorry. Well, I guess it just doesn't read that way in the report then because you're excluding the $96,000 cost of building the area design. So I guess I'm just trying to follow up. Where, where were they be hiding their cars or their office? Mr. Ennis? And I will apologize if that was not clear, Councillor Cook. What we were saying was that uh, the cost of the OPP base is not to be funded from the $800,000 envelope. We are going to build that, we are going to incur the cost, but we're not looking to finance that from the overall package that was put forward to you. Councillor McGugan. Then Councillor Marriott. Yeah, Madam Ward, members of county council, I guess I have to admit I am confused. I hate to say that, but in the end, 
how much is the OPP putting in actually in dollars over the next 30 years, and are they moving their whole detachment down there? And if they aren't, why aren't they? No. Um, OPP has a plan, as I understand, to move from where they um, are located now, and we have um, designed space to include them in, in our project and in, uh, in, our, in our space. So we understand that their needs in the short term are to have some satellite office. Now, this isn't a staffed office 24 hours. This is a location that they maintain a visible presence so that they can do um, assessments um, with their um, uh, clients that they can uh, meet and have some office space there for use. So that's um, those needs and requirements as described to us have been included in the scope of the project. So they will have a, a presence um, in forest area and in this location. So that, that's how the design is set up so far. It's not a headquarters or anything like that. That's in Petrolia. We're just talking about a satellite office so that they can do business in um, the area. Follow up, Councillor McGugan. So are, are we just getting $96,000? Is that a one time or is that, you did mention rent or Mr. Innes did. So what are we getting over the long haul? Uh, now do we have to put in special uh, barriers, you know, for confidentiality? Are we spending extra money there or really? I... Mr. Innes uh, indicates he can respond to that. Uh, no, we are not getting, uh, we are not limited to retrieving or recovering $96,000 from the OPP. That is the cost of building the space in the building. Uh, what will happen is that when the building is uh, completed, we will be at the same time concurrent with that entering into negotiations with uh, the province and the OPP for a lease to have them come into the facility. They have been included in the discussions over the design. Uh, the idea behind it is that uh, they are going to be able to have the privacy they require uh, in the area that is set up for them, but by the same token, the fact that it's part of uh, our EMS base, which is staffed 24-7, it allows for the additional security of the site, which is one of the issues that they have with a lot of these satellite offices. So uh, the payments uh, that will come in will be designed to cover the operating costs. In other words, uh, the uh, utilities uh, associated with uh, that space, as well as the recovery of the capital cost. And then we would be looking for those, uh, that lease payments to continue after we've recovered our costs and to generate uh, uh, some additional revenues going forward. So there is no, there is no time limit. There is no maximum here. We're simply uh, indicating the fact that the sunk cost to provide the space to the OPP will be $96,000. We will recover that cost through the rent payments uh, going forward instead of looking to finance that cost uh, through the uh, debt that was originally approved by Council. I'll move on now to Councillor Marriott, then Councillor Arnold, then Napper. Thank you, Madam Warden. County Council, through to you, uh, Mr. Ennis. Two questions. Um, I don't see a square footage in here. Can you enlighten us on footprint or square footage? And as well on the uh, fees and permits, why they're so high? Um, uh, the square footage we do not have right off uh, the, the, at the tip of our hands. Uh, Mr. Lucas um, will, uh, I don't think you have that, but we can get that. <clears throat> Mr. Lucas? regards to the, the cost of the permits, um, the, uh, the fees that have been included here so far have been uh, site plans, have been submitted, and all the other various uh, planning documents through uh, Lambton Shores. Is that correct, Howard?
Council. Oh, follow up, Councillor Marriott. Thank you. Just uh, and then one other line near the general requirements, one hundred and seventy nine thousand. Like to end up with with the building of doing the rough um, uh, explanation of the four hundred square feet for the police and two bays and the washrooms. It just seems like. You know, a million dollars is a lot for the size of the building, so maybe the general requirements uh, can help explain some of the costs as well. The, the, the concerns that you're expressing over the cost, were quite frankly, as we indicated in the report, uh, we were almost gobsmacked when we saw the prices come in. Because through the entire process, uh, when Mr. Lucas was meeting with Mr. Taylor and his staff, with the architects and the people designing this. Everybody had assured us up to that point in time that uh, the cost to build the, pro, the, the, the design that they had come up with would fit within this $800,000 envelope. When the price came in well in excess of that amount, uh, I think the excess figure was almost uh, 40%, um, my first uh, question to uh, Mr. Lucas was, you know, what are we doing here? Are we building something that, uh, you know, are we building a Cadillac when we, what we really need is uh, a Hyundai? And uh, we sat down and took a look at, that, uh, at the building. It is basically a cement block building. There is a little bit of uh, cladding in some places uh, for it, uh, but uh, the design parameters are not uh, uh, unusual or excessive on this. Uh, the bay is, it's a double uh, drive-through bay, Howard, is it? Um, it is uh, a high bay, of course, which has something to, uh, some co imp uh, you know, impact on the, the price. But the price we're talking about here also includes uh, all the infrastructure on the outside of the building as well. So we're talking paving, we're talking landscaping, we're talking fencing requirements. Uh, this is the entire package with the exclusion of uh, furnishings or furniture that is required to make this building operational. Um, we believe that by the time we sat down, we, take, uh, we, uh, we looked at it, that uh, the costs that are represented here are the realistic costs for the, uh, the base that we are looking for in this location, in the current market, for the, and that the, uh, the price is reasonable for the, the size of it. Uh, we did talk about whether or not we could uh, adjust the size. If we reduce the size, we compromise the future functionality of the building and its ability to uh, continue well into the future. We, current, we believe that based on our current uh, analysis that uh, what we have here should serve us well into the future. It also, the building is designed in such a way that if we needed to increase the base uh, space um, in the future as well, that's relatively easy to do, uh, both of us how we're proposing to orientate it on the property and as well as the construction is there. Yes, I agree that the price is, uh, is, uh, uh, seems to be uh, alarming when you first look at that. But when we sat down and we spent a lot of time going through this, quite frankly, we've spent um, the better part of six weeks going through and trying to determine what the answers are. We would not be presenting it to you at this point in time if we not, did not believe that this was the, uh, the best price for what we need based on the inputs that we received from Mr. Taylor and his staff. Thank you. Councillor Arnold and then Napper, and then I'll look uh, to call the vote. Thank you, Warden. I, I guess I was looking for the same thing with the total square footage, which we didn't get, but uh, at a 40% overage on the budget, I guess I'd have to question uh, how we come up with the budget number because there's stuff in here and, and that, and the fees and permits, a certain amount of that's going to come back to the county anyways. So, you know, that number isn't quite as bad as it looks. But, uh, you know, for us in our municipality, when we look at our building permits and fees for a 5,000-square-foot building, uh, for an industrial building, they're about uh, $10,000. So, and that's building and development fees. So, you know, I think that that's quite expensive for that when I look at that. But, but I guess I'd... I really struggle around a 39% spread between the estimate and where they came back in at, and for somebody to tell me in two years and things have not gone up 39% in two years. So I really question why that there's that much of a spread, and, and John, you, you mentioned that you guys have gone through this a number of times, but, but, and it's legitimate, but still I question the legitimacy of a 39% over what our estimate is because I know our folks, they estimate well. They always have. 
and uh, I, I just find struggle to see and wonder how much when it says County of Lambton on the tender that that influenced that 39 percent. Mr. Ennis? Uh, I, I share the, uh, the, the feelings that uh, Councillor Arnold has uh, presented and I can tell you that <clears throat> there have been two instances uh, that I've been involved with where actually three where the uh, the estimating that was used or the basis for the budget has come back and proven to be uh, far off uh, the first one would be Maxwell Park Place um, the original design that we had and it was the same thing we said to the architect of the day this is the budget that we have to build the building the first design that came in was almost double and we said no we go uh, we sent it back at that point in time to get it uh, to get it corrected when we were building the, the JNAG, uh, quite frankly, um, the, the estimators for the, uh, the successful bidder um, did a horrible job of that. Uh, we spent uh, a lot of time arguing back and forth with them. Um, because of the efforts of staff, we were able to contain the cost where it should be, but I can also tell you that the uh, party who constructed that lost a shirt on it. We're just half thankful that they are professional enough to uh, oblige or to um, follow through with what they were obligated to under their contract. The pricing for this, the estimation of this, came from the architectural firms. We went to them, we said, this, uh, so the process started off with, what do we need? So Andrew Taylor and his staff identified what their needs were. They conceptualized that into an idea. We presented, the architects came to us. We said, what is the cost to build this? $800,000. Thank you very much. You're sure about this. Yes, we're sure about this. All right, let's send it out to the market and uh, to uh, see how they bid. The bids came in, um, and in the report we indicate that this, I think it's the seven lowest bids were within 10% of each other. When that happens, that makes it very clear that uh, the pricing is going to, is uh, what the pricing is. That represents the real cost here. This we do not have the expertise in building these buildings. We rely on third parties to provide us the, uh, the information for the estimates. And quite frankly, we feel that we were let down on this one, that uh, they didn't do the job that they should have done, done the diligence they did in going forward with it. Because if they, you know, if they had done, if their numbers were hard, hard going in, when we challenged them back to reduce the cost down, they should have been able to reduce the cost down back to the envelope because that should have given us what we were looking for with regards to the, uh, the requirements we had. 67,000 was all we got off of that, which meant that we were still uh, you know, 25% above where we should have been in the first place. So that was where we, uh, we were in a conundrum at that point in time because we knew what was required. We knew what we had presented to council as the budget. And then the next phrase was, so what can we do? Are there things here, you know, are there other things that we, uh, that, that can be optional? Can we phase the project so that we could uh, reduce the scope now and look to expand it at a future point in time? No, we couldn't do that because of the design of the building. So in the end, we looked for alternate sources of revenue that were available. And then, as you saw, we ended up with a small amount that we uh, actually, our costs that are not going to be incurred until the building is constructed and we're suggesting that it goes in the 2016 budget. So, uh, you know, we did not present this and we do not uh, uh, enjoy presenting something to you and telling you that the original estimate we brought to you was wrong. We, uh, as a staff, take pride in, pri in giving you the best information and the most accurate information up front. And quite frankly, when this happens to us, we're embarrassed that we have to come back to you, but we've done everything that we can after the fact uh, to correct the situation that was put upon us by a third party. Thank you, Mr. Ennis. Uh, I'm going to recognize Councillor Knapper, and then I think we've had a robust conversation. I'm going to call the vote. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I do sit here with quite a bit of interest. I don't know why in this project we reinvented the wheel. We built one at Petrolia less than 10 years ago. We built one over at Watford. Uh, Sam McRae's out there's got... Is this building... That much better? I understand it was three or four hundred thousand dollars to build Warwick, wasn't it? It was more than that. What is a standard higher than what we've already got out there now? Somebody speak briefly, Mr. Uh, Lucas, to the question of standard.
Follow up, Councillor Knapper. You're not going to come back here next month and say we got to upgrade those other ones, are you? They're grandfathered. I believe they're separate. Okay, thank you very much, Council. I'm going to call the vote now. All those in favor? Opposed? Whoops. That motion is carried. Opposed again? Do you want to put your hands up? Please, aye. Okay, that motion is carried. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on now to committee minutes. Uh, uh, Councillor Marriott, for the morning committee, please. Yes, Warden. Um, just to confirm that the uh, AM committee did meet on November the 18th, and I submit the uh, minutes as uh, posted. Item one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Councillor Marriott. I would uh, move the minutes as uh, presented. To uh, Chair Councillor Knapper. Thank you very much, uh, Warden McDougall. Uh, on behalf of the uh, PM Committee, I submit uh, our uh, meeting minutes for your approval. One, two, Councillor McGugan. Madam Warden, members of County Council, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Someone could explain to me what is going on there with the PSWs and the RNs and the cost and the long-term uh, repercussions. Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Warden McDougall. To uh, Councilor McDougall, um, this is a uh, long-standing scheduling issue that uh, went to arbitration, interest arbitration, or pardon me, rights arbitration. Um, and the arbitrator awarded that um, how we were scheduling uh, needed to comply with the ratio that was imposed upon the county some 20 years ago. So what essentially will happen is that we will be uh, transferring shifts from RPNs to RNs. Um, this will have an impact upon the PSW. So you're, you're right in your analysis that this will impact the PSWs uh, from the point of view that, uh, or, uh, that the RPNs did part PSW work, part nursing work. Uh, we can't send the PSW works to the nurses. One big reason being it's a cross-union bargaining issue. So um, the costs that are in the um, um, uh, report that I sent to council is only for m moving the RN, uh, RPN hours to the RNs. We are currently doing an analysis of what that impact is upon the PSWs. Uh, it will go up because we do need PSWs. They do the majority of the day-to-day -day hygiene, feeding, um, um, work that goes on in the home. So we are working on a report currently of what that impact will be, and we'll be bringing that back to council in January of uh, 2016. Councillor Knapper, on the same item. Uh, thank you very much. Uh to Mr. McGugan, um, I think the PSW workers are, I've got a, a, a movement out there now to uh, have the government fund them for four hours per patient per day, which uh, is recommended in the, the report that come out, and they're not doing it, they're only getting, what, three hours a day, I believe. And I think it's very important if they got that, that would probably maybe put back some time to the RPNs in, wouldn't it? Mr. Doyle? Thank you, Warren McDougall, to um, Councillor Knapper. Yes, there is uh, currently um, many of the uh, unions that represent PSWs as well as the uh, long Ontario Long-Term Care Association, which is for-profit, 
and also the uh, municipal uh, sector onus, which represents uh, or helps represents the county on matters in front of the government, are supporting a move to four hours of nursing care per resident per day. Currently in the county, we are about uh, three hours and 10 to three hours and 15 minutes. Hopefully my numbers are accurate. Um, if you look at uh, from Ontario perspective for 77,000 residents, it's an let's say it's an average of 45 minutes per day. Um, onus, and I said on their funding committee, uh, we are projecting that would be $625 million more dollars required into long-term care system to deal just with the current demand in our homes. And as we know, the demand into long-term care is um, probably at one of its highest peaks uh, over the last 20 or 30 years. It still will get higher. Um, the reason f that we want to go or looking at going to four hours uh, per resident per day is that we are receiving or, or we are taking in um, individuals who are uh, uh, who have been staying at home through the aging at home initiative so we are getting individuals who are much sicker their acuity is much higher they are closer to end of life stage and those are all intense areas of care for, for an individual. They are also probably the most expensive um, years from a, a medical point of view, pharmaceutical, nursing and intense um, hands-on that are required and we are experiencing that in all our homes that um, um, the need for more individual care when our, the, for the new residents are coming in and this is strictly based on higher acuity that we see of individuals coming into our home so yes there is a move afoot to move to that four hours per day uh, and that is currently sitting in front of the current government where it, it will go no one knows but we'll just have to wait and see Councillor Napper. I hate to be a pain. I, I would like to make a motion that uh, we uh, support uh, this letter from to, uh, Kathleen Wynne that's uh, addressing the non-willing host. We all stood up here in the last few years and uh, I haven't seen anything that's changed my mind yet. And I would like to uh, see if I can get a seconder to support that letter. Councillor Bradley, discussion? All in favor? That motion is carried. Number five. Six. Oh, sorry. Uh, Madam Warden, members of County Council, I hate to belabor this swift, but uh, I guess if we move this today, it just we send the $20,000. I just hope this is good money spent. I, as you are, everybody's aware, I do have some concerns. Uh, I know you've tried to uh, leave me of those concerns, Warden McDougal, but I guess it's going to go anyway. Thank you. Number six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, thirteen, fourteen dealt with in camera, fifteen. Chair Napper. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to move these meetings, uh, these minutes, and uh, look for a seconder. All in favor? Opposed? That motion's carried. We have no items tabled from previous meetings. Other business? Councillor Council Napper. Well, thank you very much, uh, Warden McDougall. Uh, I rise today to uh, announce that, that uh, at the committee meeting of uh, October 21st, 2015, it was announced that after 38 years of service to the county, of, to the county, the general manager of Cultural Service Division would be retiring effective January 4th, 2016. Um, when Mr. Tremaine was hired into the position of general manager, Cultural Services Division, he identified a number of strategic initiatives which were required for the division to remain responsive to the changing needs of the people in its services. 
completing and implementing such initiatives has been the focus of his general work as general manager. Specifically, the following were undertaken and achieved during his tenure. So and there, just to touch on a few, there's a Lampton Culture Plan, the uh, Integration of Culture into the County Sustainable Plan, and uh, finally the, the gallery. And uh, I think uh, we'll allow him to retire. He met all his obligations he set out to be. And uh, on behalf of County Council, I just uh, hope, Robert, that uh, it's been a long time. I remember when I first come here back in the I'm starting to sound like Bill Bilton now, but uh, years ago you were a, a curator, I believe, at the time, and we were then just books and junk. But now it's changed a lot, and uh, I certainly congratulate you on behalf of everybody. And now that you're retired, perhaps you can go around and tour and see what good work you've done. So let's uh, give him a good hand of, for 38 years of service. Thank you, Councillor Knapper. Uh, Mr. Tremaine. Thank you, Council. It's been a pleasure to serve the people of Lambton County for 38 years. And I've really appreciated the support of this Council to take 31 facilities and position them and tune them up so they make a difference. They enhance quality of life across the county and they help make this a community of choice. I thank you for that support. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Gillis, hands up, please, so I can get you on a list. Case, Veen Bradley. Uh, thank you, Madam Morden. Uh, I just wanted to report back from the FCM conference, or not the FCM conference, the FCM board meeting that I was in in Ottawa that I left uh, early meetings on November the 18th. Uh, we met with several ministers. Uh, one in particular uh, is of interest to everyone here, I believe, is Minister Sohai, or Sohi. Um, he's the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. And after meeting with FCM uh, with regard to infrastructure and the P3 procurement that was put in place by the previous government, um, we have learned from the meetings that there is a, the removal of the mandatory P3 screen for federal infrastructure programs and that uh, local discretion on whether to use them or pursue P3 will, will be now the uh, order of the day. The other thing I wanted to let you know that uh, we were talking at the time when I left on affordable housing and uh, where that is in the priority order, and that is the number one priority of uh, the municipality organizations going right across the country. So that is going to be addressed. The other thing was uh, with the new infrastructure dollars, how is it going to be rolled out? Um, the suggestion, or one of the suggestions was made that they follow along the same model as they have the gas tax being rolled out. So those are some of the highlights I just wanted to let you know. Councillor Gillis, uh, Councillor Case. Yeah, Madam Warren, to you, um, it's my understanding, I don't know if everybody in this room knows this, but the Southwest Economic Assembly is no more. Can you clarify that you are a sitting member on that board? Is that the case? Yes, Councillor Case. Uh, we attended a meeting in London. Uh, the group, um, uh, as you served on, and I had a very limited amount to do with, um, we met... We uh, voted as a collective body to fold the organization. And at this point in time, at our last Western Wardens meeting, uh, Western Wardens Caucus has um, uh, made a decision to try and organize itself through uh, a chairman from Wellington County to pull together uh, wardens from the region and their economic uh, development uh, representatives to talk about how else those needs could be met. Councilor Case, follow-up. Just a real quick follow-up. I hope that when your group takes a look at it, we learn from their mistakes because there was numerous mistakes within that organization. Started off on the right foot, in my opinion, with all the right goals and objectives, but lost its way. So that's just my only comment. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Councillor Case. And uh, at our last meeting, there was a robust discussion 
about how to avoid mistakes uh, of a new body moving forward. Thank you. Counts, uh, Deputy Warden Veen. Thank you, Madam Warden and members of County Council. As you're aware, Oil Springs is celebrating the 150th year this year, and I would just like to thank the County Council for their participation this year and their support. And without you, a lot of the things couldn't have happened. So again, thank you very much, and I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and please drive safe. Councillor Bradley. Just a response to, to Councillor Case there, that there will be a new organization of, on, on, of urban mayors announced in the next, could be today, could be later this week or next week, uh, to replace SWEA. Um, it was not an effective voice for, for urban concerns either. Uh, two uh, items, one is minor. Uh, Mr. Innes, if you could find the money to fix the 10 minute clock so it works throughout the meetings. <laughs> okay. Second, um, I did say at the last meeting I'd bring a notice of motion on a new process for the uh, CAO's review. And um, what I'd like to suggest is that uh, a committee be struck similar to the ones we've done in the past, the warden, deputy warden, and someone from each area to come back with a uh, uh, recommendation. And I do have the process from Sarnia, which I can supply to the clerk as a, as a base for discussion. If county council is willing to do that. That is noted. Notice of bylaws, Mr. Cribs. Were you, were you making that a motion? I gave uh, notice was, the last meeting that I yes. bring a notice of motion. The notice of motion is to establish a okay. committee of the chair of the warden, the deputy warden, and one from each striking district to report back in the new year on a uh, process, for, a new process for the CAO, CAO review. Okay. And I will supply information to the clerk on that. Okay, seconded by <coughs> Councillor Bride. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Sorry about that, Council. Mr. Cribbs. Thank you, Warden. There is a motion before Council that bylaw number 36 of 2015 as circulated be taken as read a first and second time. That's moved by Councillor Veen and seconded by Councillor Cook. All in favor? Opposed? Yes, Warden, there is a motion that bylaw number 36 of 2015 as circulated be taken as read a third time and finally passed. That's moved by Councillor Weber and seconded by Councillor Knapper. That motion is carried. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Bruzewitz, Councillor Gillis, all in favour? We'll adjourn to our uh, next meeting of County Council for Wednesday, February 3rd, 2016.